You're listening to The Mount of Spirit, a podcast of Christian Appalachian Project, or CAP for short. This is a place where we get to share with you inspirational stories of faith, service, and compassion. I'm your host, Tina Bryson. I'm a firm believer that we're all connected by our shared humanity, and that finding that intersection sometimes just means having a conversation. Today, we get to hear from Brenda, someone just like you and me, that in a moment had her life turned upside down. This firsthand account of surviving a flood is also a story of the resilience that abides in the people of Appalachia. I hope you never forget Brenda's story. I'm what you would call a bit of a news junkie, meaning I can watch the news endlessly and never get tired. But in that, also I realized how quickly the news cycle changes. And the thing that was a top story today could be out of the news cycle within a few days and we have moved on to something else. That is normally what happens when natural disasters strike, just like the one that hit East Kentucky in July of 2022. I know that may seem like a long time ago, but there are families that are still struggling to put their lives back together. Organizations like Christian Appalachian Project are committed to be there for the long haul. And CAP committed early on to help 100 families get back into their homes. And I've recently had a chance to meet Brenda, who was our 100th family. But CAP is still on the ground helping families even above and beyond that 100. But today, instead of trying to tell you Brenda's story, I thought it was important for you to hear Brenda's story in her own words. Like some families in the area, Brenda didn't receive all the help she needed when the floods first happened. And sitting there listening to her story, I was so moved by the journey that she has been on following a disaster. Disaster relief is that immediate work that happens, but disaster recovery is really walking with families for the long haul, not only to just get their homes back, but to get their lives back. So today, I wanna share with you Brenda's story. I've actually lived in this same place on this same property all my life, but I've actually owned and lived in this home 23 years. I have two granddaughters that I have custody of. The 18-year-old, she semi-lives here since she turned 18. And then I have a 16-year-old that lives with me. I've had her uh, going on nine years. He's been gone 14 years. I've somehow got to not look at her as being him. I've got to raise her, and it's hard to do, but She's so much like him, and that's his only child. I promised him I'd take care of her. He passed away of colon cancer. She's got a lot of him in her, but I see a lot. Uh, she's a goal setter, She's a, and uh, she's very compassionate. I blame myself because the type that can't look at you and, and say there's something wrong with you, she looks at you and wants to fix you. Oh, she says she blames me for it. (laughs) I was a counselor and a case manager. Honestly, I started out as social worker. And um, I realized that without social work, there's criminology. And the the crimes and the time in prison um, was due to addiction. And uh, so I went back and I got a double major. I got a bachelor's in social work slash criminology. And I completed my degree in April and went straight to work in September in a, a maximum security women's prison. And it was a whole new world. It, it was just, you know, I had to wear these multiple faces. I called them my mask. And when I left the house, I was a mother and a grandmother and all this, and a daughter. And when I walked through those prison gates, 
I was no different than those prisoners. It's just that I chose a different path. And um, I left that and went into, I, well, I actually done the residential drug programs while I done. And I realized they was human. And it made me realize that how much I take life for granted. And it completely changed me. It made me realize that, like Papa said, Papa told me one time, he said, little girl, do the best you can do, and nobody can do any better than you do it, you know. So that was my motto, you know. And I, it's like, I, it's like asking you all for help was hard for me because I, I sent people to you all. And now it's like, it's like I said about the prisoner, you know, I'm on the other side of the fence and it's hard to ask for help when you fix so many people. And it's really hard for me. It is. It's, I can, I've taught myself when I lost my son that there's nothing in this house, nothing in this house cannot be bought back. It can be bought back for the right price. But I can't bring him back. So it's really changed how I look at things, you know. But this house Daddy built and watching them repair it is hard for me because they're taking up the last thing I have. That's his. Although I know it has to be repaired to last another 30 years. But, you know, I watched him sweat. I watched him in the bottom back here by the house, he cut and logged all this material that's in this house. So it's hard for me to watch them, you know, tear. But then I think, you know, that's material, Brenda. You've got to cut the line and it's hard. It's really hard on me. They was a flash flood watch, which there always has been for us. Growing up here, it's never flooded. Never. I mean, the water's got high, but it's never come over the banks. And that night, about one something in the morning, Fred come in. He woke me up. He said, "You've got to see this." It was one thirty, and uh, I got up and I come to the back door, and I looked down, and that water was even with my porch. And my cat was sitting there looking at it, and he was terrified. And it was dark, and about 10 minutes from standing there, the electric went off. And I'm like, oh, my God, you know, I can't call for help. You know, I, I can't get out of this, you know. And I'm not going to lie, I got down my knees and I prayed, and I said, Lord, don't let that water get over this porch, you know. We can't get no words, you know, I mean. It was so scary, and when daylight came, it was like the water was was over top of the. I mean, it was it was crazy. It was like an island because the water was all on that end, and it came all the way around. And you could look out this window and see it. I mean, there was no bottom. It was like the ocean. It was all water. And I was, I mean, I was terrified. I was like planning my escape. I was like, well, I can get out front and get on the house, you know, and the whole bottom up there that I own was nothing but water. I mean, I prayed and prayed and prayed. I've never prayed so hard in my life. You know, Lord, just let me live through this. You know, you try to bargain with him to let you live. And I kept, I kept praying and praying and praying. There was a four wheeler come through and he said, they're giving another flood. I said, why, you know, we ain't gonna make it. And he said, I'll come back and check on you. And the water got even higher the second round because it had already, you know, washed everything out. So it's like it pulled. We could see where it had made it up a little on the front yard. It had made it up the two front steps, but it was horrible. It was like it stayed and stayed, and, and uh, this uh, guy comes through, and he tells us again, he's like, I brought y'all some water because we didn't have no electric for six weeks, and we didn't have no water for over two months. 
that guy. I still don't know who he was, but he just kept coming, you know, and every time he came, he'd bring us case water. We started trying to, uh, you know, look at the damages, and I said, what am I going to do? It had washed all of the drain lines. It had lifted the commode completely up out of the floor. I never asked for anything. I couldn't. But then when I was in a car wreck, 411, I almost lost my life. And because of that, um, I thought, you know, I've got to come around. I've got to quit. I've got to put this independence behind me. i got to ask for help. I promised him I would raise her. That's when I, I got the long-term recovery. That was a lady set me up with her, and she got some of the materials. They hooked me up with Jill. I had called Jill into my application and everything, and when she come out, her and Scott and them did, and they seen how bad the floors was, you know, and stuff. And, and uh, Scott called back, and he says, I got some good news for you. <laughs> He said, we can do your house before winter. And I, I, I'm cry, I cried on him like I am. And he came out and he said, you got a lot of work, but we'll do the best we can do, you know. Yesterday, when they came, this morning when I walked in, oh my God, I couldn't hold it back. It was like, there's good people out there. There's really good people. And I didn't have to do nothing before, you know, I always felt like I owed them so much, or I paid for it. You know, I never had any, anybody do anything for me after Daddy died. And it's like, I, I don't even know the words. All I know is, thank you all so much. Because honestly, after the wreck, I don't know what our future is going to be. But we're going to have a roof over our heads. And that's what we need, you know, as long as we have the five basic needs. And we wouldn't have it without you all. I thought I was going to be here by myself, you know, and I was scared, very scared. And I took my cats. It was so hot because this was in July. And we went out and stayed on the front porch. And the porch swing is where I stayed. And of course, I worked word search, and I worked every puzzle she had. I could charge my phone in the car, and I'd do it during the day because I was afraid, you know, but I was afraid I'd run out of gas, which flood had got my car anyways. It got underneath it and got up in the Cadillac converter, and I lost that vehicle. But when I got out, and I walked this property and seen the damage in there. I knew, I was like, oh my God, such destruction. I mean, my chain link fence was just, the poles was just hanging out there with no dirt under them. Daddy had built all along the outside the chain link fence, cherry trees and apple orchard. It was just all fruit orchards. And I watched them from the time he planted them. And they was a, like a little island outside the fence. And the kids would go down there and sit on it and put their feet in the water and play with minnows. And it's all gone. <laughs> It's all gone. All three kids learned to walk on this property. And Daddy always said, little girl, this house is going to be yours someday because I know you won't sell it. You'll take care of it. And I lost him 23 years ago to lung cancer. So I've owned it. I did end up with it. And I took mother just her daddy, and I took care of her until my brother took her. So it's like I lost another child. And I put my brother through college because he had just started more him when daddy died. But I was raising my three kids, mother and my brother. And, you know, the flood took it all. It, I can't bring it back. <laughs> it's so bad. I mean, you said, you wonder, are there going to be another one guy? And then I think about how I was one of the lucky ones. I survived it. My house did, but I did. I'm a survivor. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. 
Does your construction business want to make a difference? The Lend a Leader initiative gives trained professionals the opportunity to serve our Eastern Kentucky neighbors who are living in substandard housing. Join our monthly mailing list to receive one-day opportunities for carpenters, electricians, plumbers, drywall installers, and painters. No commitment necessary. Email volunteer at chrisapp.org. That's volunteer at chrisapp dot org to learn more. Folks in East Kentucky are used to forecasts of heavy rain and flash flooding. But when that rain came in July 2022, 16 inches fell, turning peaceful, beautiful creeks into raging rivers, sending water so fast and intense it swept homes off foundations and carried away cars and people. More than 40 people died in the flooding, and nearly 9,000 homes were destroyed or seriously damaged, leaving many families like Brenda's in over 13 Kentucky counties in need of assistance from the local community, the government, and nonprofits. Volunteers from across the country came to help these families in need. Let's listen to more of Brenda's story. I was having to buy little, about like hair chair bottom. I was having to buy, I think those pieces of plywood on the porch, that little square, I was buying one a month and hauling them in the back of my car in order to get the bathroom floor covered. I had bought the sink and it sat on the front porch for over a year because I couldn't get it in. I couldn't get the floor done enough to get the sink in. I mean, we've not had a bathroom sink since the flood. And the bathtub, it's got the, the shower nozzle and stuff, but it's not in place, it's there. But that's the best I could do, you know, I mean. And it, I was having to buy a little at a time, like even to the plumbing supplies. The flood had jerked the wires and took all the drain lines and everything. So when it took it, it had shorted out. When they turned the water back on, it filled up the hot water heater and sucked all of that stuff up in it and destroyed it. I couldn't, I couldn't win. I mean, it was like, there's no way I can pay $500 for a hot water heater. So I had to put a five gallon bucket underneath the pop off valve thing because it had broken it underneath it. It broke it off. They turn the water on, then they turn it back off, and then they turn on, then they turn it back off because there was just so many lines, you know. And it's like they turned it on for about two weeks, and then it had blowed some lines, so they had to shut it back off again. So Larry didn't have a hot water heater. It didn't have a washer. I was just like, you know, couldn't go out on the back porch. The whole back porch was gone. And the block steps that's out here, it crumbled them where they was underwater so long it just crumbled. So we, we couldn't go out this way at all. Between the flood and the car wreck, I've lost 52 pounds and it uh, broke all of my ribs. My lung collapsed. I'm looking at back surgery. In December, I had a blood clot in my stomach. I was in the trauma unit and I had nobody. Nobody was with me. So, you know, the scariest thing in the world is that you're going to die by yourself. Every time I had to put my feet on that floor and go to that bathroom as bad as I was hurt and all of my ribs. And I kept thinking, well, what are you going to do with me, you know? And I was thinking, well, God, you know, he saved me from the flood. He's going to get me through this, you know. I kept saying that. But it's just so much fear and so much trauma. It's like, here, you know, I lost Daddy, then I lost Josh, then the flood, you know, and the car wreck. And I kept saying, I must be doing some good on this earth. I'm only one person. But then I look back and I'm like, well, he won't put nothing on me that I can't handle. My fiance, he kept telling me, it's okay. He said, He's paying you back for what you've done. You know, all the lives you've saved and, and everything, you know. The flood, we see it on TV. Who'd ever thought, I got a flood. And there's nothing scarier than standing at that door watching that water come up on that porch. But I never got it done. Not like these guys are doing it. 
I mean, uh, these guys can, re can build a house in three days, I'm telling you. And they hand you the keys. They're amazing. They're good people. Captain's a good program. My living room floor was sitting on the ground. It wasn't even attached. I didn't know it was that. I knew it was that bad, but I didn't know it was that bad. So they took that whole floor out and they had to go in and rebuild the whole thing you know, actually come from the walls around. And in the bedroom, they had to take all of that floor, the, the subfloor up. When I walked in there and opened that closet door, <laughs> and my closet was floored, it was like, oh my God, I'm worse than a child in a candy store. <laughs> Christmas comes once a year and it hit me this year. I was so happy, I am, I'm so happy. They finished my bathroom floor, they done the warren, but they are fixing all of that and they're actually hooking my bathroom sink up. I'm so happy. I'm washing my hands in the bathroom <laughs> sink. They're going to straighten up the, the plumbing. I have this um, handle thing on the side of the bathtub and where the floor was so low, you know, getting out of it, I was falling real bad. And they fixed it for me. I could actually get out of the bathtub and I'll have hot water. You know, you think how long it took me to get probably six or eight pieces of plywood that would fit in your trunk because I had no way to do anything. And each time, you know, I bring it, put it down. It's funny because I told Mother, I said, you know, Mother, Daddy built that thing to last. Without the flood, it probably would have. With these injuries and financially, I mean, we have nothing. We have no cash assistance. We have nothing but food stamps. I told mother, I said, how am I going to raise her? You know, I can't go back to work. And Christmas is coming up. you will find a way. I mean, I got to learn to just leave it to him. I mean, I'm seeing a therapist for the PTSD from the, from the flood. But then, you know, when, when you... When they give rain, I'm terrified <laughs> because they give rain that night. When they give rain or a flash flood or something, you know, I mean, I panic. I don't sleep. And I keep thinking, what if I hadn't woke up, you know? And then the second round, and they kept saying, you all come down, you all come down. You don't leave your homestead for nothing because that's all you got. But it's just, I mean, it was over top of the heat and cooling unit out back. And I had to pay $800 because the debris that got in the fan on top of the heat and cooling. But FEMA didn't think we, need, you know, we needed anything. And it's like, you get tired of asking and asking, and that's what I did, you know. Heat and cooling unit, it heats the front part. This back side, I have to use this heater. This was my secondary heat because where I live at, you don't just, they just don't come out and fix you electric right. heat. And so I always had the secondary heat, but all of the water and everything's on this side. So we'll make it. We will. We will. It's hard to put it in words. Keep the blessings coming because... I mean, before I was working, I had income. I was still struggling, but look what you all done for me. And you all can't do what you're doing if you don't have somebody doing for you. Like I said, the smallest of things was turning the light switch on for me and having a sink basin to wash my hands in. I wouldn't have that without donors. I really wouldn't. I mean, I get to live in my house now, and I couldn't do it without that. I really couldn't. I mean, they're more than welcome to come and walk through my house, eat a meal with me, use my bathroom, and I can show them the pictures before and after. But because of that, and people like you, I mean, she's even excited. She says, now me, Ma, can we let people come and stay all night with me? This is a blessing to me. 
I mean, like I said, I'd probably never lived to get them. Not afraid I was going. But I tell you, all my life, I've given, and it's donors that gave it back to me. This little group that's working here today, oh my, they definitely moved these eastern Kentucky mountains. They're a blessing, and the donations keep them coming. We need them, you know, we really do. Having people like these people that's out there willing to help us, you know, it really makes my faith stronger. We hope you never forget Brenda's story and that you'll check out next week's episode of The Mountain Spirit. Tell your friends to check us out too. You can follow the work of Christian Appalachian Project on all social media channels and find the show online at christianapp.org slash podcast or anywhere you get your favorite podcasts. Be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. We'll see you next week.